all around the world and all throughout time, you can count on more than a few monster-themed stories and legends. So what does the word monster mean to you? It's a very broad term, I think, and in my view, there's a few ways you can go with that, and I'll talk a little about each one in no particular order. One path I take is cryptozoology. Crypto meaning hidden or secret, and zoology is the study of structure, habitat, or evolution in the animal kingdom. The Bigfoot, Yeti, or the Yowie is probably the most widely known cryptid today, and perhaps some form of long-lost great ape. In the past few episodes of Lore and Legends, Thunderbirds, and even hunting mammoths come to mind, there's an argument that some of the creatures from older mythology or stories might actually be real animals on some level, albeit ones who lived a lot longer than science says that they were supposed to. It might also interest you to learn that the mountain gorilla was once a cryptid to the Western world, and they only existed in stories from remote areas of Africa. Now, I'd wager that most zoos in most moderately-sized cities have a gorilla or two. Another example of a cryptid is the coelacanth, an armored fish that was found off the coast of Africa that was believed to have went extinct some 66 million years ago. And you know what? In the spirit of mysterious biology, I'm going to say that aliens are in this category too. After all, is hunting the cosmos for virtual tracks with giant sound recorders and telescopes much different than scouting the woods with a tape recorder and some binoculars? Another form of monster, though you may not think so at first when you hear the word monster, is of the more spiritual variety. This category is really broad and spills out into a lot of things we might just roughly call paranormal. Paranormal meaning we can't explain it scientifically. Ghosts fall into this category, poltergeists being one of the more popular ones, mischievous entities that can interact with the physical world. The word poltergeist literally translates from German as knocking spirit. As the name implies, they are usually associated with strange noises, the bumps in the night, or the mystery footsteps upstairs, the opening of doors and windows. At first, these things are dismissed as coincidences, but they become more and more bold as time goes on. Now, it wouldn't be fair to mention ghosts and not mention the idea of ghosts of people long gone. You probably don't think of them as monsters per se, but it isn't all that different. One of the ideas behind many alleged hauntings is often that someone felt a powerful negative emotion in a place, and maybe even died as a result, leaving behind a sort of negative energy, if not lingering there entirely. Prisons, battlefields, asylums, and murder scenes are often places where this is said to occur. Man can be a whole category of monster as well. On a large scale, perhaps men like Cambodia's murderous former dictator Pol Pot, or of course Adolf Hitler of Nazi Germany, Joseph Stalin of the Soviet Union, maybe a historical figure like Vlad Tepes, the inspiration for Dracula, or Attila the Hun. Of lesser status and scale, but maybe just as monstrous, or even more so on a personal level, would be serial killers like Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, BTK, Sutomo Miyazaki, known as the human Dracula, for his necrophilia and cannibalism. Quite certainly humans, even without any outside help, can be just as terrifying as anything else. But the most terrifying monster stories, in my mind, are the ones that blur the line between all the categories above, and a few more, touching on aspects of physical reality, the metaphysical, religious belief, and man's own penchant for evil. Monster stories pervade the human timeline, and as such, there is a massive variety of stories that involve monsters. Some of them have starring roles, and in others, they're merely side characters. Many legends of monsters aren't even about a specific story, but rather merely just describe a monster that may roam the woods in a certain area, or offer a warning about the consequences of certain actions. So for this episode of Lore and Legends, we're going to take a look at a couple of these legendary monsters that appear in North American history that have persisted across time and culture by blurring the lines of reality. But first, let's take a quick break. One of my favorite broad categories of lore, if you haven't been able to tell so far, belongs to the Native Americans, whose raw connection to the world around us is perhaps even more legendary than the legends themselves. 
Native American lore is full of everything you might expect to find, in both ancient mythology and modern religion. And indeed, in many areas, those beliefs are still practiced and preserved. In past episodes, I briefly touched on a few monsters. In my very first episode ever, Coyote, we explored the legends of Coyote, in which many of them involved monsters or spirits. In the episode titled Thunderbirds, I discussed the legends of the Thunderbird, from both a cryptozoological standpoint as well as a spiritual standpoint, as they face off against serpent-like water monsters bent on destroying the earth. In Navajo creation lore, we get the mysterious Mirage people, more water demons, sorcery, and the first hints of shapeshifters. And in the last episode, titled Hunting Mammoths, there's a story about a monster called the Yakwawi. So let's look at a few Native American monsters we haven't really discussed yet. And let's start by going back to those shapeshifters, the skinwalkers. All skinwalkers are witches, but not all witches are skinwalkers. Witchcraft, in much of the Native American world, isn't uniquely evil, contrasting it to the way that it's viewed in much of Western culture. But there are still plenty of bad witches, and the skinwalker may well be chief among them. A skinwalker is something that a person becomes. Usually, they start off as a good witch, but then they go evil. To reach skinwalker status, it requires an act of extreme evil, something along the lines of killing an immediate family member in cold blood. And the desire to do evil only grows from there. Skinwalkers gain the ability to transform into animals, and they're believed to wear the skins of those animals when they do it. The word for skinwalker in Navajo, yi naudlushi, translates roughly to, with it, he goes on all fours. This shape-shifting ability allows the skinwalker to move about unseen as virtually anything they desire. The Navajo believe skinwalkers can and do walk around in human form by day, blending into society and always looking for the next victim. As such, speaking about skinwalkers and possible encounters or circumstances involving them is taboo. Because if a skinwalker catches you unawares, you're likely to make the target list from anything from the mysterious bumps in the night all the way to murder. There are a few books on the subject that I'll list over at loreandlegends.net that contain some very recent stories of skinwalker encounters, which involve anything from the feeling of being watched when you're alone to superhuman witches attempting to push cards off the road as they're moving. The only way to kill a skinwalker is to know who they are and say their identity to their face. Which goes hand in hand, perhaps, with the reasoning behind why skinwalkers don't like you talking about skinwalkers. In Utah, the infamous Skinwalker Ranch gets its name from the terrifying monsters who have been blamed for some of the strange occurrences there. I contribute to another podcast called Skinwalker Radio that is centered around the phenomena on the ranch. Check it out if that interests you. I also plan to do a very witchcraft-centric episode in the near future, so be sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss that. The other monster that I want to talk about in this episode, that checks all of the boxes that the Skinwalker does, and maybe even more, is thought to wander the forests of the Great Lakes regions. It's called the Wendigo. The Wendigo is generally described as very tall, at around 10 to 15 feet, with a pale complexion and extraordinarily emaciated form, to the point to being living, but still a rotted corpse. You'll frequently see them depicted with an antlered and bloody skull as a face, though that isn't always the case. Either way, the Wendigo is truly monstrous. But what are they exactly? A paranormal cryptid, a spirit, or a person? The answer, it seems, is all of those things. One possible origin story of the Wendigo is centered around a once great warrior who was desperate to win a conflict for his people, so he made a deal with a proverbial devil. The man is granted extraordinary abilities, bridging the gap between supernatural and physical, and these abilities allow him to swiftly defeat and devour his enemies. It's hard to imagine a more complete weapon. The Wendigo's presence, or mere perceived presence, inspiring an overwhelming sense of fear and dread in its victims. The smells of death and decay fill the air as the sky gets dark, and you can literally feel the energy drop around you. 
the death rattle that is its breath getting closer and closer, only appearing before you at the last minute, leaving no time to react as it kills and then devours. But at the end of this war, this Faustian pact was realized. In exchange for these abilities, the warrior can't return to his tribe and is banished to the cold and remote wilderness where his power leaves him with an insatiable appetite for flesh and really becomes an unbearable curse. In another story, the Wendigo is just a side character in a story about how man came to be with the first dog. It goes like this. A couple of Indian men arrived on the shore of a strange land after a storm blew them in the wrong direction. Soon after, they encountered a giant who was the ruler of this new place. The men hid in fear as the giant approached, but the giant took pity on them when he saw them, two lost creatures without food or weapons. So he brought them to his camp, and soon after that, the Wendigo spotted them. The Wendigo tried to lure the men away from the safety of the giant by telling them the giant was actually evil and often captured men to eat. But the giant heard this and was having none of it. This angered the Wendigo, but before he could pounce, the giant flipped up a large bowl, and from under it sprang a strange wolf-like creature that chased and ultimately killed the Wendigo. The humans were enamored by this new creature, the giant called a dog. Seeing their bemusement, the giant said they could take the dog with him, and that he would help them get home, which baffled the humans. They couldn't believe that a creature could obey human commands like that. The giant then sent them off home with the dog, and the dog did indeed guide them to the right shore, and the dog remained with them afterwards. This sort of attempted deception by the Wendigo is something that comes up in the late 1800s in the story of a Cree man named Swift Runner. Swift Runner was a respected hunter and trapper in his local community, and for the winter months, he took his family into a cabin they had in the woods. Except, when winter was over, and they tried to return, his family wasn't with him. Swift Runner's in-laws weren't buying his excuses, and so they contacted the police. The police took him back into the woods and back to his old camp, where they quickly found the scattered bones of his family, including the skull of his wife and a shallow grave for one of his sons. Swift Runner told them that one of his sons did actually die. But he started having dreams of a Wendigo, telling them what he needed to do, that ultimately made him kill his wife, and then have one of his sons kill another one of his other sons, and then he hung a newborn baby, and ate all of them. Swift Runner had been possessed by the Wendigo. He was arrested and hanged in May of 1879. Wendigos are broadly associated with people who resort to cannibalism, starving and emaciated, but never satisfied, no matter how much they consume, and they have to live with the knowledge of their taboo. They're also associated with just about every negative emotion or feeling you could possibly have, whether it's fear, cold, pain, isolation, death, loneliness. Once a person becomes a Wendigo, there is usually no escape but death. It is also possible to become a Wendigo by possession, and in fact, this may be one of the more common ways it happens but there may also be a fine line between possession in a literal demonic type sense and possession as a descriptor of the mental state of people who have embraced the idea of cannibalism, crossing a line they can never uncross. The last part there is really interesting to me, as it represents and acknowledges a descent into madness. And if you think about the idea of the human, or perhaps humanity, being hidden in the heart of the Wendigo, it's a great metaphor for a person who has succumbed to their worst tendencies. And oftentimes, people who go that far no longer even have the ability to realize that they're wrong. There are stories of whole groups of people becoming Wendigos or becoming possessed by the spirit of the Wendigo, who continue living together as cannibals, and the remaining people plot how to eradicate them from the land by using a magic or hiring hitmen. In some stories, this seems to be viewed as an almost normal thing that came up once a century or so. Check out lorenlegends.net for more on that story. We should also consider the Wendigo's origin in the North and its general association with extreme cold. The Wendigo spirit was the most powerful in times of famine or drought, which tend to come in winter. 
There are a handful of modern stories about people being stranded or isolated in the cold, resorting to cannibalism in order to survive. If you do a quick Google search, you'd actually be surprised how frequently cannibalism pops up when people get in desperate situations. I'll link to some of those on lorenlegends.net as well. It's worth noting that there used to be an actual condition called Wendigo psychosis, which was the craving for human flesh, and it was considered a very real thing. In fact, in 1907, an Anishinaabe shaman called Jack Fiddler was famous in his tribe for his magical abilities and his claims of fending off and killing Wendigos. Even his own brother would be killed for allegedly turning into a Wendigo. The Wendigo spirit became viewed as so strong among this group of people that sick and dying people would be euthanized in order to prevent them turning into a Wendigo. Which when you think about the description of a Wendigo as pale and gaunt and maybe going a little mad, it might seem to make sense if you're looking at a very sick person. This lasted for some time, as they were among the very last of the truly free native peoples with little to no outside interference. But eventually, the local Canadian police would discover the issue and arrest Fiddler and a few others for murder. Another common belief about the Wendigos, as it pertains to possessed or transformed humans, is that the human part of the Wendigo still resides in the heart, though there is almost zero hope of a person ever escaping their fate. Fiddler did manage to escape prison, but he hung himself afterwards, and he never faced trial. It was a powerful case of a monster, both real and imagined, that led to devastating outcomes for everyone involved. It's ironic, really, though. The man who was the self-proclaimed Wendigo killer, who perhaps ended up being more of a Wendigo in the end than anyone else. There are other creatures that resemble many of the same traits of the Wendigo as well. The Chinu is one. It's described as something like a Wendigo, with many of the same features, but a sometimes greater emphasis on anger. And in other areas, you might find a beast called Stoneclad, or Stonecoat. All of them are relative giants that wander the woods and prey on humans. So what do you make of the legends of the Skinwalker and the Wendigo? Do you believe in the supernatural and the paranormal? That feeling you get in the dark when you're alone and can barely see. Is it really just you there? As for me, well, if you listen or follow enough, maybe you could take a guess. But for certain, even though they aren't real monsters, as metaphors and symbols, monsters in any case are a fantastic creation. They allow us to capture the complexities of emotion and behavior and teach us to be alert and on guard through stories that don't require PhDs and can last generations. A modern monster flick that came to mind as I prepared this episode was The Babadook. If you haven't seen it, it's worth watching. In the movie, The Babadook was actually a stand-in for grief and depression at the loss of a loved one. While that grief was left unconfronted, it slowly threatened to destroy the mom and her son entirely. And at the tipping point, if you go the wrong way, there is not much hope left for return. Sounds an awful lot like a Wendigo, if you ask me. And if we go back to the story of the first time man and dog met, well, isn't a great contrast to the Wendigo a dog? Dogs being warm, friendly, perpetually hopeful that you'll throw the stick one more time, and always loyal, loyal enough to follow you through the worst times. This reminds me of yet another Native American story. Once a boy was struggling with what to do about a situation with a friend that had made him very angry. So he went to his grandfather for advice. So his grandfather told him a story of two wolves that live inside each of us. One wolf is angry, hateful, and powerful. The other wolf is calm, reasoning, and patient, but they are always in a constant fight with each other, to which the boy asks his grandfather, which wolf will win in the end? And his grandfather answers him, the one that I feed. Be sure to check out lorenlegends.net for show notes, links, and some additional commentary on all the episodes of Lore and Legends and a few other topics as well. You can leave comments without an account and such too. And if you could do me a favor, drop me a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen. 
That might be the best thing you could do for Lore and Legends, now in its second year. And all you have to do is tap the screen. There are also links to support the show, via Patreon and PayPal, on loreandlegends.net. And a little bit of bonus content for those that do, with more coming in the future. You can also look me up at facebook.com slash loreandlegends, or find me on Twitter or Mines, where my handle is at obiwade. This isn't the last time I've talked about the Wendigo on Lore and Legends. There will be another episode about that some point in the near future. And the next episode should be right around the corner as well. But that's all I had for this episode. Thanks for listening. The music in this episode from filmmusic.io The Complex by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 From filmmusic.io Shadowlands 7 Codex by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 From filmmusic.io The Dread by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 From filmmusic.io Classic Horror 1 by Kevin McLeod incompetech.com Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 From filmmusic.io Classic Horror 3 by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 And lastly, from filmmusic.io Jalandar by Kevin McLeod incompetech.com Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 4.0 for more information, visit creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by slash 4.0.